everyone. I'm Linda Nickel, and welcome to the Happiness Hour. Every week, photographers meet here to connect, inspire, and create. If you'd like to join us live, you'll find the schedule for upcoming sessions on my website at lindanickel.com, as well as the links to previous sessions posted to the Happiness Hour YouTube channel. Every Wednesday, my guests share their photography tips and insight into their creative journeys, and they show us how to look at a subject a little differently. Tonight's guest is Valerie Hoffman. Valerie is a nature photographer based in Pennsylvania. She's a full-time photography workshop leader, and she offers one-on-one -on -one customized classes for just about any subject that you might need help with. But in tonight's presentation, Getting Creative with Holiday Lights, Valerie will talk about good exposure, focus, composition, camera settings, gear, and even some creative techniques that will inspire you to add sparkle and creativity to your holiday photography. If you're on Instagram, you can find her at Valerie Hoffman Photography, and you can connect with Val through her website, ValerieHoffmanPhotography.com. Welcome back to the Happiness Hour, Valerie. Thanks so much for having me, Linda. <laughs> like you had uh, it. Like, yeah, I was going to say, like, <laughs> yeah, tell them how much time you gave me for this one, too. So you sometimes I have to poke and create challenges because you get lazy. And you accuse, you've, you've accused me, you've accused, I know, Trish uh, of being lazy photographers. And sometimes you need to be poked and prodded. And um, if I give you too much time to prepare, you goof off and procrastinate. So um, this just keeps you on your toes. So with that, thanks for coming. Yeah, does everybody notice how our nose is growing? Because none of that is true. Oh, big lie. Mm -hmm. A big lie. Working all the time. So... <laughs> All right. All right. Um, what did I miss? What have you been up to? I haven't really talked to you. Anything exciting? Um, Treks? No. Calendars? Your calendar is out, right? Oh, absolutely. They're out and ready yeah. to go. I'm going to give a shout out to, to Mark. He was my sale today. Thank you. And Trish. But we'll go in. We can hit that at the end. Um, But yeah, I'm just really trying to stay afloat right now i've had some some health issues which are actually getting better i can actually hear out of my ear now um and i actually can go back to contacts eventually but other than that i'm just you know taking care of things here family that kind of stuff you know not it, getting out much yeah it's it's and then you know being winter it's going to get a little harder you've already told me that you know you're you're living in fleeces and um yeah, crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't like cold. So, but All right. anyway. All yeah. right, let's just jump in. Let's show, us, show us something fun to do um, as we get through this holiday festive season. All right, well, let me start with, there's kind of four things that I just want to kind of hit as a goal for the presentation. Um, the first is obviously to help you overcome any challenges with photographing holiday lights, which there are quite a few. Um, especially since they're mainly at night. I'm um, going to give you some technical details, like Linda said, um, some tips on, you know, how to shoot, how to set your exposure, how to focus, where to focus, that type of thing. Um, lots of tips on composition, because that's really a key to any great image. And then, you know, some things um, like how to be more creative. So I'm going to start with some of the basics and then we'll get to more creative, hopefully. So, um, um, but here's some tips. So if I can say anything, my first tip would be to um, get to your location and be shooting at sunset. And so that would mean, you know, I would recommend that if that you go early and scout something out. So if this is a place that you're not familiar with, then maybe go in the light of day and get an idea where displays are and everything so that when, you know, the nice light is and everything and as it's getting darker that you're ready to get the best pictures. Because honestly, your best images are before it's totally dark. 
but I'll go through some examples and you can see um, what I mean there. So here we were um, at a small town. It's supposed to be the, I don't know, the coolest small town in the country. This is lit. It's Pennsylvania and Lancaster, and they have a ton of lights and displays and everything. So my friend and I were eating and I happened to look out and there was this amazing sky. And so I ran over and just tried to grab whatever shots that we could. Um right here so when there's still some color in the sky but your lights are turned on that's a great time to begin photographing i'm doing it this way from lightroom because a lot of people ask you know shooting information in that and i'm leaving that right up here in the left corner for you so you can see you know maybe what lens i used and you know the exposure and everything um, a little tip is if it says the hdr there then i did at least three shots that i merged together in Lightroom there. Um, and for those of you that are not familiar with how Olympus is, if you want to compare my um, focal length to full frame, you my focal length will be double what it would be on um, full frame. So this would be like nine millimeters. Um, hope I'm not saying that backwards um, for on a full frame camera. OK, because it's a micro four thirds system, which I now exclusively use, but there will be some, you know, a variety of cameras used in the presentation. But sunset, get out during sunset, any color in the sky. That is a great time to be shooting. It looks great with your colored lights. Um, find some fun subjects, whatever that um, might be in your area, especially if you can find some rusty old things or whatever. Um, so at Longwood Gardens, I'm there several times a year for Christmas, and I knew they had these floating trees on the water. And so I thought that might be a neat place to go and try and get, you know, the sunset and reflections um, going there. So you can get started. It doesn't have to be totally dark. And a lot of places like gardens and things, they will start before sunset, lighting everything up. But you know, this is inside in their conservatory and it's just look at the beautiful. It's kind of like a painting outside the windows. So it just makes everything look that much more colorful and vibrant. Another we have 20 minutes away from me. What is arguably one of the best Christmas displays in the whole country and people come from all over to see it. And that's a place called Christmas Village. Um, and so this is a shot um, panorama shot from up on a hillside looking down. But again, I'm there at sunset, ready to shoot um, and go from there. And when it's sunset and blue hour, which is my next tip to really go crazy at blue hour, um, you know, that's just the best, um, I think, kind of images. So blue hour is after there's no more color in the sky, you know, from the sunset, but before it's totally dark. And that still gives you separation. Like you can still see this tree here, even though there's no lights on it. You can still make out things. It's a great time to do cityscapes. Um, but it's definitely when I'm trying to really just fly around and get as many pictures as possible because I love that blue backdrop um, for the images and it gives you nice separation. So here's just a couple different ones showing you the example of blue hour. Even as it's almost dark, you know, just you have that deep blue in the sky. So, and then here's a couple different, so this is early blue hour, you know, there's a, at this point, your lights are generally, the exposure in your holiday lights will generally match the sky, and so you have a very even exposure, you don't need to bracket, um, in most cases, which is great, once you get to that black, you know, the night sky, then it becomes a lot trickier with really bright lights and then really dark sky. So you want to get as many in as you can. So now the sky is getting darker. I love to shoot around reflections. Um, so anytime, I love that for sunrise, sunset, but with lights too, that's just an, uh, an extra something, something I think for the images. And then now it's almost completely dark. So you see, I'm starting to lose um, detail in trees and things, but there still is that little bit of blue in the sky. Um, so if I could encourage you, you know, to be out then, I really would. Now, my next tip is to fill the frame with color. So in this image, I have a lot of dark space here, right? 
Um, you know, sometimes it's really hard to line up lights and say so you don't have a lot of black sky or foreground or whatever. But so I, you know, I kind of like this image, but I would like it a lot more if there wasn't so much darkness. So I'm going to move around when I'm trying to set up a composition and try and position myself in some way that I have very little um, black blob spaces and the rest is filled with light. And that's a nice way if you have something in the foreground and the background. And now, let me just ask real quick. Are uh -huh. you, I knew I've traveled with you. You kind of like stay on a tripod. You're on a tripod for some of these, right? Or most yes. And I was just going to say that because I don't have a lot as far as gear. Like you can use whatever gear you have, but tripod is the number one piece of gear. Now, I was just doing a lesson with someone last night who's not going to, they're doing a family thing and they're not going to be able to use a tripod at all at Longwood Gardens and I'm um, going to Cape May, but I absolutely, if you can, you should, because that's the only way, I mean, look, I'm at 1.3 seconds. Um, you know, you may say, oh, my camera can go to 8 million ISO and I don't mind doing that. Then go ahead and hand hold, but you'll have a lot more creative options too. If you, you know, are using a tripod so you can get really long exposures, which we'll see a little later. So yes, ma'am, I am. So just fill the frame, like find something one of the, the hardest things I think in these big displays, whether it's gardens or like at this um, Christmas village, is there's so much going on, right, to try and, you know, distill it down to something smaller. Like, don't try and get everything in. Just pick little sections um, and start photographing them so that you can fill the frame. Um and I always like to look for if anything's spinning. We'll talk about that a little bit with shutter speed. But if there's something in motion, I like to have that in my image as well. And so now I can do a five second exposure, but have it razor sharp because I'm on a tripod. So just a couple more, just fill the frame crash, sorry, with your color. And even here, here's just some tree trunks. You can make a nice picture out of trunks. Um, so before somebody asks, maybe I'll hit that. So the little starbursts in the lights. So generally, you can get that little burst um, out of most lenses if you shoot around f11 or f16. So a smaller aperture should give you um, little starbursts on your lights and you're never going to be able to shoot at f16 you know handheld so little tip so again find where all the color is just zoom in tight on that i think a great lens to use would be something in a mid-range like a 24 to 105 um, I probably use my 12 to 100 Olympus for the most part all the time now when I'm shooting light displays. Um, I generally carry a wider one to mess around, but that's usually a good, good range. Um, but yeah, shoot up into trees if there's trees that are lit can be pretty cool. Um, something here is I see these bright uh, uh, snowflakes, <laughs> drawing a blank here, for exposure. The, the best tip, you could probably get away with, like on this kind of image or even this past one with a lot of brightness. You could probably be in aperture priority, but as it gets dark, I think you're really going to need to be in manual exposure and just be controlling um, that yourself because the camera's meter just really doesn't know what to do with dark darkness. And it generally will try and make um, something black a gray, right? So you're going to wrestle with your exposure. So if you're in manual, you can, you know, just be changing your shutter speed around to let more light in or less light, less light in. Um, as you can see, except for times when I am trying to get a lot of depth of field, I'm mostly wide open with my aperture and then just choosing a, an ISO that will give me enough light. If that kind of makes sense. Um, and I'll talk about shutter speed and some things in a little bit. But the other thing, not only go into manual so you have a little more control, but use your histogram. You want to make sure and have, turn your highlight alerts on. Make sure you don't have any blinkies, okay? If you have some blinkies in, blinkies are like areas when you have highlight alert on that tell you what areas in your picture have no detail, 
in those highlights. So something like this, it doesn't matter. You know, they're kind of white. I'll tell you why some of these are kind of fuzzy too um, with wind. But if you have a lot of blinkies, like it wouldn't matter to me if the white here was blinking, but I wouldn't want any part of my tree blinking. Okay. Little lights that are already white, they're going to be blinking, but the rest um, should not be. You should have detail everywhere. Now, I think in all fairness, since my friend is here, that I think I comp stomped this um, image from Christy from New Jersey. So she can say, hey, I, that's my shot. So, yeah, I love this. But a, a good tip here would be, you know, like use some framing, you know, again, just move in tight on your subject. Um, and so in your um, composing, you know, Think about shooting through lights as well. So there was a tree made out of these flowers that for the love and anthurium and yeah, that I can never remember, but they were, the tree was kind of lit up. And so I, you know, was standing just kind to the back of it and um, shooting over then getting the tree, but notice there's kind of some framing here, right? Like this keeps your eye in the frame. We've got some darker um, foliage below so you want to, you know, look for some framing and minimize spaces that don't have lights or color. And interestingly, I'm sure I was on a tripod here, whether it was legal or not, since it's at night in Longwood, but to be able to shoot it at 14. So composition, here's a couple other things. I like, I like to shoot through, you know, I have that framing. So there was this tree all lit up. Um, the branches all lit and then some trees in the background. And so I just focused um, right on these lights in the foreground. So focus is really important. Um, I would never let my camera do the focusing, um, make the focusing decisions for me. I would always manually control the focus point and put it where I want it. When it's in low light, I think a lot of you probably know that the camera has a lot of trouble focusing and um, it's almost never going to pick the right place, maybe with lights. So here I focused on the foreground, the tree got that nice and sharp, and then it's just kind of framing this softer tree in the background. But here's another um, time with this tree, and this time there's some fog, and that's kind of neat, framing it now horizontally. And again, I'm just at these starbursts are from the smaller um, aperture. And then, you know, the best time to shoot a vertical is after the horizontal. So, you know, I thought the horizontals were good, but hey, throw a vertical in there too. You never know what you're going to like better. And this one, if you notice the tree's a little sharper because now I'm at F22 and have a little more depth of field. And the starburst is like a little more pronounced as well. Um, I don't think it matters. You can try. I'm just looking at white balance here. You can try being in auto white balance, um, but most holiday lights are probably daylight balance. And I would just, you know, prefer to just kind of shoot it there. That way the camera's not trying to correct any color out of anything. Um, and, and again, that doesn't matter as much if you're in raw, but I like to have my image looking pretty close to natural. Um, again, composition, fill your frame here. So this is a place where there's normally a ton of people. So I want to minimize where people might be and then where there's nothing's on the side here. So I'm just kind of zoomed in close, making the trees, the Christmas trees there, my border. Um, and then right after I shot this one, you know, I did a vertical as well. So, and the vertical then eliminates even more of the, you know, non-lighted areas. And this I'm wide open. It's just F4. You know, there's nothing really close to me. So you can get away with, you know, having that wider aperture. Um, here's another kind of, you know, examples with composition. My one and only time of being in New York City at Christmas time. I just uh, know, like, look, look, there's like, they had the streets, every other one closed to, you know, you could only walk one way, one block and another way, another block, because there were so many hundreds of thousands of people. 
and that just makes my head hurt. But I finally, this was the one shot that I wanted on this trip, forced my way to this fountain. It was so crowded all the way around. I couldn't even get in there. And this was the first shot that I got. And it just felt really off balance to me. Um, and so I thought, well, I am not leaving till I get a cool shot. So I shoved my way in a little more. And so now just moving around a little, this composition feels um, a little more balanced to me. And it just shows off, you know, this area, the neat, you know, the water, the reflections, Radio City Music Hall. Um, it's huge. So that's kind of neat. And sometimes you'll get a big scene, especially in a, a city where maybe you can't even like, you don't even know what and you can't even get it all in, then try and do a panorama. So I did have my tripod. I was up on the edge. You can see like I'm on this wall here um, and just shot a quick, I think it was like a seven image panorama so that I could get everything in from side to side. Um, one of the things that I'm looking, where is all the color? And because I use water, there's some neat reflections here. So just got in tight with the the house there and the reflection. And then, you know, what was really cool to me was all that light in the water, the reflections in the water. So then I did a kind of an abstract image just close up there. So just play around. And you can see at this point, it was just starting to rain. So there were some neat little raindrops in there as well, which you may or may not like. Um, another cool subject is uh, like shop windows. So if you can go to some little area that has some neat decorated holiday shops, that's always fun. Again, just fill your frame with the window, eliminate any doors or anything that's distracting. I would say, um, you know, to use maybe a mid-range f-stop. So this was a four, and I'm pretty sure I focused right here on the window pane. But in that case, I want to make sure, too, that what's right in the window is sharp. So again, be paying attention. I don't know how many of you, when you take a picture, you use your magnifying glass in the camera and blow it up to see if your subject is sharp. But like for me, it was all about, I really like this believe sign in the window. And so I made sure that that was sharp um, or I would have taken another picture. So before you move, you know, make sure you have the sharp image that you want. If you've got that lamp, you have to get a picture of that. Um, you know, double window, some neat stuff. And then even more than just window, maybe a couple. Here we had a moon rising there. I think it was a full moon that night. Um, so then I pulled back a little to show that, even though it's not a great shot of the moon. But some of these, you know, could be neat Christmas cards or whatever. So play around with different things. And then another thing I like to do um, compositionally is, so Longwood has a lot of trees that are made out of the strings of light, really big ones. And so I like to get right up against some lights in the foreground and shoot through those um, to something like these other lighted trees in the background. To get this type of um, look, you are, you know, using your widest aperture, you're right up against lights, and you're focusing in the background, not on the lights in the foreground. So they're just these soft white blobs or little bokeh balls, as we might call them. And here's another one where I'm just right, lights right up against, right in front of the lens. And then I had stacked up these other lighted trees, and I'm focused on those in the background, which will make these lights in the foreground bigger um and kind of out of focus and whether they're round or a little is this octagonal or whatever will depend on how many shutter blades you have in that lens and what that looks like so moving from composition to shutter speed so Usually I'm more focused on aperture, but you do need to keep an eye on your shutter speed because if there's any wind, you're gonna have motion blur. So these trees are floating, they're on stands and they just are free to move about on the water. And you could see there's some ripples in the water. So there was a wind and as they're blowing along, they're blurry. So normally that's not a good look. So you would want to switch to, and I did, maybe a higher ISO, definitely a faster shutter speed than 10 seconds. Like I didn't even realize they were moving until I did this first long exposure. So you'll want to keep an eye on that. Any string lights 
which is almost anything except something wrapped around a tree, um, they're going to go flying in the wind if um, if it's windy at all. So you're going to have to keep an eye on that. Um, here's another thing where now my reflection has just a lot of ripples from the wind. So you, what I would suggest is like when I know I'm want to go out, if I have the option, I'm not going to choose a windy day to go out and photograph um, lights because it'll just be a blurry mess, which would be a waste of all your energy. Here the wind really picked up and you can see now like the reflections and it's just gone. It's just like this blur and you can kind of feel the, the little tree floating along there. So again, for what I like to have no wind and to have that sharp would be better. Now here's another time where you might decide on what you want to do for a shutter speed. So there's this tunnel of lights at Longwood and I wanted the tunnel without people in them. Well, there was no way, like thousands, it never stopped. And so I finally just moved off to the side and started an exposure. And this was at 13 seconds. And if you're doing a long exposure, if people keep walking, they're going to disappear from the image. So they're kind of, you could see this little bit of a ghosted person here. Now in the time, in those 13 seconds, I bet 50 people probably walked through there. And the only reason you see these guys is because they stopped and did their little selfie right at the entrance somewhere in my exposure and they actually got you know kind of recorded in there so if you have that ability with your tripod you do a really long exposure and you can make people disappear which is pretty fun i'd love to sometimes do that in real life but here's another fun thing um if you have like a train in a lot of places will have um, trains running at Christmas time. So do a little longer exposure and show motion. So right here's the train. And I waited till it came around and then did like a little over a one second exposure and you got that blur. And here's another train, you know, this is in motion up here as well. So I'll set up there, elbow all the little kids so I can get a good spot. And um, just play with your shutter speed. So you could go to shutter priority maybe and just dial around and go a little slower, a little faster. I think if you go any slower than one second, you're not even going to know, like you probably didn't even know this was train moving here. Um, you know, it'll just blur so much that it almost disappears. But if you have that little bit where you can see, make out the train, that can be kind of fun. And then for this, when I took my first shot, I, my tree was blurred and I'm like, what is going on? But everything else was sharp. And I didn't realize just looking at it, that that tree was slowly turning. So in order to really showcase that, because you don't always see a, a Christmas tree that's just rotating. Um, I set up my tripod, did a really long, you know, six second exposure. And that gave me um, a full spiral and what made me decide on six seconds because through trial and error with different shutter speeds I knew that it took like six seconds to give me some full lines because it was moving that slow so again playing around shutter speeds can be creative um, I'm not that far from Hershey Park they have the park open at the holidays there's lights everywhere and a lot of rides are running and I just usually go with some friends to photograph the lights in motion I don't even remember if I did a presentation on that before, but I love to get light, you know, amusement rides lit up um, and do some light painting with that. So, and I'm definitely not going to be riding rides in 20 degrees. So I'm just going to go and take some pictures of things. And it's, it can be pretty fun. In this case, everything is stable or stationary, except this tree that's made out of lights, but is also spinning. And so by doing a longer exposure, um, you get the motion of that tree, which is kind of neat. And then I moved off to the side so that I had just more black sky as opposed to the building behind there. And now you can make out those lines um, of the spinning a lot better. And this one's a longer um, shutter speed too, or slower one at six seconds. And then because eventually I get bored and want to play, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but then I start zooming. So the the lights themselves, the little tree is spinning on its own. And now while it's spinning, I'm zooming. And um, that can do some some pretty neat things. I'll, I'll talk about that a little more. And then, 
you know, so we talked about shutter speed and we're showing the motion with the shutter speed. Um, and now let's just talk about depth of field real quick. So I like a shallow depth of field with, with holiday lights. In this case, I use, you know, F4. Again, that's my widest on this lens. And I was pretty close to these um, little soldiers and it rendered the background just nice and soft. And so whatever sharp is where your eyes, excuse me, going to look. And so that soft lights just makes a nice background. Then I walked down to the edge of these or the end of the row, and I was really close to this first soldier, and again, just focused on him. And then with the wide aperture, just let, you know, let it compose so I could see everything down the, the line there, and they went off nice and soft in the distance. And so that's more creative. You know, your eye, you don't see it this way when you walk up to it. So consider playing around you know, with different apertures, definitely different compositions um, to get different effects. And let me point this out right here when we're talking about depth of field. And this is true no matter what we're photographing, whether it's macro or whatever. There, a lot of people think that it's just whatever aperture they use that affects the depth of field, but there are several factors. So it's your aperture, but it's also, and this is a big thing. Um, it's how close you are to your subject and how far away the background is. So the closer you get to your subject, and I wish Mika was here to confirm this with like bugs, you could use F22 um, and be an inch away from a bug and only get his little eyeballs sharp. So the closer you are to your subject, the more the shallower your depth of, depth of field will be at any given aperture. Um, and then the third thing is the greater your focal length, then the shallower your depth of field. So I'm zoomed in here. Um, I got 100 millimeters going and then I have a wide aperture and I'm really close to that first one. And that's what gave me that really soft line of soldiers. OK, but when, you know, you compose differently, it'll look different. So again, here's an example. I don't know if all of you know how to figure out how close you can physically get with each of your lenses. That's one of the things that people usually get lost about. So I want to be as close, you know, the, those light bulbs are just like this big. So I want to be as close as possible to that so that I can get everything out of focus. So you can simply turn your lens into manual focus, turn it all the way to its closest focusing spot, which you might even see in your camera as a little um, little flower or some other macro symbol. And then just move yourself in and out at your subject until it's sharp. And then from there, you know, just kind of compose and make sure whatever's in the foreground is sharp. But if you do that, that's how you can get the shallowest depth of field by being close. And again, this is this is not a wall hanger, as Mike Motes might say, but it just shows, you know, it's very different from what the eye sees in having that shallow depth of field. And then my most favorite um, use of the shallow depth of field is having bokeh or bucket or however you say um, these nice balls of light. So that's what these nice circular sort of out of focus lights are. For this particular image, all I did was turn my lens completely out of focus and I was at a wider aperture. And I'm guessing because I can't see what lens it was that it was a lens baby, uh, most likely velvet, but turn it all the way out of focus. And then you get you, the lights become these big, soft, round um, balls there. And then if you're using maybe a different focal length or you're further away from lights or whatever, you'll get different, you know, sizes of these lights and everything. But I love doing that. And this is, again, just an out of focus light shot, which for those of you that do textures or whatever, um, like to put different backgrounds, you could use these as a neat background for something. Um this image, again, I really wanted, I moved myself so that I had just solid lights behind there. Um, shot at my wider aperture, which is F4. I was as close as I could be to these hanging candles. And then waited like, I don't know, three and a half days till there were no people walking behind them so I could get um, this picture. And it just looks, it's a beautiful, non-distracting background. 
in my opinion. Um, in another similar situation where I'm just, I'm really close to this poinsettia, I focused on that wide aperture. So in this case, I'm using a nifty 50, which is a great lens to do this type of thing. Um, and so since I'm focused here, all my lights in the background are soft. And I think it's neat having that child, um, you know, just be soft and out of focus. It's just totally different from what your eye might see. Um, one of my favorite images is this. Now, this is just a candle in our living room with a Christmas tree, but I purposely used my 7200 lens so that because I wanted these bigger lights. So I'm zoomed in almost all the way at 200. I'm as close as I can be to this candle. And then the tree lights just kind of look like this. So this can make for some beautiful cards, whatever. You know, it's just one of my favorite shots of with the bokeh lights. Um, just a little toy that spins. So I'm using a slower shutter speed and just a half a second to have that little bit of blur at the top. But I made sure to move myself to where I only had lights um, behind it. So that was my whole background. And then, you know, here, here's what you want to look for. Again, some Christmas ornament, if you want a shot like this, where you can get pretty close to it. So I'm physically as close as I can be without stepping into the garden bed. And then I'm looking and I want just lights behind me and then at a wider aperture. And you can just create some neat images. Now, this one I put in, I don't like this nearly as much. You know, you can say why, but, um, you know, in the, the chat, but there aren't nearly as many lights behind it, right? So this is really cool. This doesn't have nearly as many lights. And so it doesn't have the same impact. But if I can move around, find a different ornament that I can get with a lot of lights, then you can create a pretty neat image. And then this, this is a series of a couple images. This is one of my favorite examples of, you know, creating those soft lights in the background. So there's this little flower and maybe Linda, you're the expert on plants now. This is a little guy. It's just a little flower. You have any idea what it is? I don't. Not a, so yeah. go ahead, what? I said, I've seen it, but I don't know. Kathleen can It actually looks like it's a bigger flower, but it's not. It's very tiny. So I'm physically close to this flower and focusing right in the middle of it. Um, but I chose a flower that had Christmas tree in the background. And so at my wide aperture, then those lights are like way across the room. They give me this nice um, backdrop. But then I got a little... I zoomed in a little more. And so now look how the, ball, the you know, the book of lights have gotten bigger and they seem to have come closer, right? Now everything seems a little more in your face, same aperture, just a different focal length. And then this next one where I'm in physically as close as I can be. Um, and then you have the lights that are even that much bigger. So by all means, try this in your home when you put up a Christmas tree or whatever and play around with something in the foreground um, and your lights in the background because that can be you know pretty neat effect. And just a couple more. Because this is my favorite thing to do. If I'm, you know, I'm always trying to create these these lights in the background because that's just a kind of a a wow factor. And the human eye, when they're walking by, nobody is seeing this. So that makes it, you know, just a neat image. This is just some, you know, branches on a display outside and the lights off in the distance, just focus on the branches. And it's just kind of an interesting abstract. And then this is a great um, way to do portraits of your family or friends or whatever at the holidays. So again, I'm using a nifty 50. I'm physically close to my friend, Deb, right? I'm focused on her and then we put her in front of um, this house that's in the background. And now you just have all these really neat soft lights. So this was on a workshop and we took turns doing portraits of each other to have that neat effect. And then, you know, it's added when you have the red noses and everything because it's freezing cold um, outside. And the last thing is that you can get a little more, I don't know, creative with by putting something in front of your lens. So I don't think my friend Pam's on here, but the one year for Christmas, she gave me these little um, 
I'm trying to do it, little things that go in front of your lens. So this would go down and it would give that star effect in your light. You can make your own, you can make whatever you want, or you can buy a set and whatever you put on the lens, whatever that pattern is, is the way your lights are going to look in the back. Um, because most of my lenses are larger now, like a 72, I found a bigger one. And then these little things just pop out. So here's a snowflake. And so that's what my lights would look like. And usually kits come with like tons. There's probably 10 different stencils and things in there. You could go on YouTube and Google, how do I make little bokeh cutouts? And they'll walk you through how to create all your own. I see this would be a great thing for Karen. Like she could be doing something cool with that. So there's some examples with the star. And then there was one that was even these little smiley faces. And so there's kind of one shot with those. And then my last fun topic, so more creative ways that you can get some unique images. So for this shot, I used, trying to find it, a, um, a kaleidoscope filter lens. It's pretty thick. And you just put it on and it gives you kind of a sharp image in the center and then these other duplicate images all around and it kind of has a neat effect um, and that image was slightly out of order so there'll be a couple more of those but one of the things right off the bat that you can do to give your um, images a little more pop is put a star filter on and they're just called star or cross screen and usually they'll come in four point six point or eight point so this is an eight point one um, and you could say, man, I, I don't like the effect or I do like it, but with the right image, it can look kind of neat. And sometimes they might have this little rainbow effect in them. So I like to play with that. Um, a four point is probably a pretty nice one. That's what this one is. And then you just shoot some different um, shots of a Christmas tree. These again would make great greeting cards if I actually had my act together and tried to sell anything. Um, Here's one where, you know, I think this is kind of wild, but it can be kind of neat, but just again, the, a four point, but it really gives you kind of this glowy etching um, on a tree. And now here's back to the, the prism filter. The prism filter is a little more expensive, like the, the regular star filters are probably under $20, but this thing is probably closer to 40 or 50 because it's really thick glass but you can do some pretty neat things with it and it's pretty neat for flowers too like i think kathy's got to be thinking man i'll put one of these on a lens baby and rock it and just sometimes i'm in this neat christmas place but i got no creative juices flowing and so i'll pop out that filter and then, oh look i made multiple frosties and it just suddenly looks fun and then you start you know maybe getting other ideas of fun things to do no questions so far we good i'm sorry i was muted um we had a couple of questions i was gonna hold them you can or, you know just start okay. checking get a drink of water yeah let's hold them Hold them. All right. So look at this. This is like, well, this is kind of a stupid image. It is. It's just to show you what's coming. So this is one of those, again, a tree made of the holiday lights, the string of lights, and it's coming from this one tree and I'm standing directly under it. And what I do is I take my camera and I lay it completely flat on the tripod. I loosen the collar so that I can spin it. And I get that. So that is totally like a crazy shot and is totally fun. And you can change your colors in, you know, and your editing, do whatever. But all you really need is a shutter speed long enough to get a full spin, if that's what you like. Um, and I just thought this was really fun. You know, again, I had everybody doing this on a workshop, just spinning. And it's just kind of a really neat image. And here's another one where there's a tree with lights and spun the camera. And again, you want to be on a tripod to get those really, you know, nice crisp lines. This one, it didn't go all the way around, but it kind of even reminds you of star trails, you know, how they trail when you do a longer exposure. 
And then this is what will happen if you're not using a tripod and you're trying to do any kind of twisting and turning. This looks like this looks like a bad accident when you were drinking and you shouldn't have been driving or something. But it, for this, I'm doing like driving where I'm just turning it side to side. And because I couldn't keep straight, you got all the little wiggly wobbly lines there. But it's kind of fun um, to play with. So anytime you have a longer exposure and this was eight seconds, whatever you do, you know, when there's lights, you move the camera, you're going to get some um, light painting. So we are in one of my favorite things to do, and that's intentional camera movement um, with zooms. And so there was just this um, lighted sign, happy holidays, and it's reflecting in the water. So I have a little bit of a long exposure and I zoomed it during the exposure and you get this neat kind of shot. Um, do I start in? Do I start out? I start all over the place and I never, ever remember what I did. So, cause I just play a lot. So usually I think I start with things further away and zoom it in. But so if you're trying this, um, you'll want to do it both ways and you'll even want to try maybe zoom in, out, in, out, maybe don't zoom all the way, just do a little bit. Um, but you just need a long enough shutter speed that'll give you a chance. And I think that would have to be at least a half a second for you to turn the lens. Okay. Cause a lot of times I've tried to do a shot and didn't even get the lens turned because the shutter speed was too slow. And then if you have a longer shutter speed that you have the time, then try not just doing a quick zoom, but in this case, I started with the zoom out. I triggered the shutter, but I didn't zoom for like a second or two. And that recorded the smaller happy holidays there. And then I quickly zoomed out and then left it be. And that gave me the solid larger one too. So you can play around with doing different things. Just go crazy, zoom in, zoom out. Um, really crazy. And I had to have wiggled here because you can see the little wiggly lines. This was in one of those light tunnels that you walk through. Actually, I know what I did. I had the camera on a tripod and I was doing the exposure while I was walking through the tunnel. So it looks like I'm in a time warp. And yeah, I really don't care what people think about me when I'm out shooting at all. And then, so back to this, so a couple different examples, the thing spinning, I'm at a slower shutter speed here, I'm doing eight seconds, and now I'm going to do some form of zooming. And I think you could tell from the lines, like I've zoomed in and out during this exposure, in and out, and every shot is a little bit different, that's why you tend to forget what you did, um, in and out, just playing around. And you could do some really fun stuff. And then just some other different examples. And this one, I did let the, you know, stay a little bit longer on the tree and then zoomed really quick at the end so that you could see that tree outline along with the lines, which is pretty fun. And then you could also take your camera and just do a swipe. And that gives the the look like this um, tractor was just flying through the air and just came in for a landing. So you could do that. Um, the trunks of trees that I had earlier, you can just spin from side to side and get this little motion. And because I froze a little bit before moving, you can see the trunks and then you have these interesting lines. Or you can just go crazy on those things and just wiggle your camera all over the place. I'm telling you, it's pretty addictive. It's pretty fun that you get all kinds of crazy stuff. And then something that I don't usually remember to do, but play with the focus. You know, if you saw my, my thing with the focus pull fireworks where I start out of focus and then move in. So I'm starting... I believe out of focus when I trip the shutter and this is a five second and then slowly turning it into focus or start in and maybe slowly turn it out of focus and you get that sort of blobby look, which can be kind of fun too. And then if your camera has built in multiple exposures, either double exposures or that you can do like a lot of cameras can do maybe up to seven or nine images and then stack them together, then play with that. So this is a final image that was made out of this first one where I shot 
um, slightly out of focus on my subject. And the second one, I turned the focus ring all the way out. And so that shot and that shot put together gave me this, which again is almost like the what they call the Orton effect, where it has that little bit of glow. And then... Um, I don't even know what I did with this. This is double exposures and just playing around. I mean, I'm really, oh, what do you think I did here? Um, but I know that I have lights really close to the lens and that's why they're so, you know, the big balls in there. Now this one is a combination of three different images. So see how you have the light within the light within the light there. So, and again, this is just a boring fence, which is this. So my first shot is just this little light. And then my second shot without moving, I'm on a tripod, is now zoomed in to have it a little bit closer. And then this one zoomed in. So it's really close and you have that. So, you know, I like to ask, what if, and then just do something crazy. Well, what if I go running through a light tunnel with the camera exposing and see what you get? And then this was also a double exposure where I did one, I believe, sharp and then one out of focus. And again, just turning out of focus. So we're towards the end here, zooming. Blobby lights in and out of focus. Shooting through. Again, if you don't, you haven't ever done shoot throughs, you want to do that with your lights because that can be really fun. But again, pay attention to where you focus. Uh-oh, what just happened? Um, and make sure that what you're going to look at first is sharp. And then here, this one is a multiple exposure too, where something sharp and then the other one's out of focus. And then my last um, intentional camera movement one is... Um, you, what you can do, this isn't really holiday lights, but it is at a holiday display. I set up a 10 second exposure and then just slowly kept changing the lens, you know, a little bit at a time. So not all at one zoom, but just incrementally. And you can get that neat little staggered effect. And then lastly, if you do have some celebration or something going on where you can add fireworks to your holiday lights or something else cool, like a lot of places have maybe a tree lighting ceremony where they'll have fireworks or something. If I can get, you know, two different cool things going on at the same time, I'm all there. And then my last tip is to watch the weather and actually get yourself out in inclement weather. So nobody likes to stand in the rain, probably. But I'm telling you what, when Longwood Gardens is letting 100,000 people in a day, on a rainy day, there's not that many people. And so and just look at the reflections. Like this really makes my heart sing. And because of the atmosphere, you know, you got the fog in there. So that's just such a different picture from the other 100,000 that you're going to see from that day there. And this orange in the sky, now... I may have juiced these a little bit in the color, but um, that orange in the sky is because I'm pointing towards the parking lot and that's mercury vapor lights back there. And it gives this eerie kind of glow. You know, but just look at the pretty reflections that you get on damp or wet paths. And the fog, fog and mist, if you have any of that go out there because it just gives, and it can help get rid of anything distracting too. It just gives kind of a nice atmosphere and any condensation on windows. So if you see that and you have the lights behind, um, you know, focus on your glass, focus on your little water drops here. But that's a really fun thing to do. I have some different colored lights and everything behind. So that, look at that timing too. Um, is all of my tips i think <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot of them okay that's a lot. <laughs> all right take down your um screen if you don't mind two questions one we're going to help um the people that are in the longwood vicinity i think this was kathy's question how did okay. you how did you sneak in your tripod what's the trick there's no way I'm saying any of my tripod longwood tricks 
live. <laughs> I have I have spent a lot of years working on how I can shoot images. <laughs> now, first of all, let's be clear. Outside, you can use a tripod. You walk right in the door, wave it. You can use a tripod the whole time outside. Just don't block anybody. So that's not an issue at all. Inside, um, that one shot with the really pretty like blue, uh, it was actually... 10 50 and they closed at 11 so there was nobody else in there and i popped my tripod out um i'll usually have a rolling bag now you can expand on this thought i have a rolling bag and the tripod when i'm not using it will be in the rolling bag and maybe because i don't want it to hit me it might be bungeed to the rolling bag and then because i don't feel like carrying my camera i might have the camera on the tripod that's bungeed to my thing and it's just sitting there and oh maybe i'll trip the shutter while that setup is happening but if a lot of people do something stupid you're going to get us all kicked out <laughs> all right okay one question this goes in um it goes to the photo where you took a picture of the train with some movement do you remember that one without going back uh -huh. to okay mm -hmm. um jamie's curious could you do an in-camera multi-exposure to get a couple of them going around? Well, they're going to, it's going to like overlap. So you're going to see that unless you just waited and shot it and then waited and shot it here. But I think there's still going to be parts that might overlap. But yes, you could try that. I've never tried that at all. Okay. Yeah. Well, that is the end of the questions. Um, a lot of people had... Um, had some fun in here. So I think that you did kind of, you know, get some creative ideas together. Um, I think the biggest thing that I'm going to have to find out is <clears throat> some cool displays because um, you have access to some wonderful, wonderful Christmas uh, lights. Absolutely. Um, amazing. Sorry, I just had that little tickle in my throat. It's not too late to come here. The, the Longwood display is till the first week of January. So fly on in and uh, book your private lesson with uh, Ben. <laughs> you book a private lesson, then you might get some other tripod tips. And, yeah. and incidentally, a lot of places, if they see no tripods, they count monopods as tripods. So even if you have one thing, unless you tell them it's a walking stick, you're not going to be allowed to use it. All right, let's not do that. Like, we can think about it, but let's not let's not advocate for that. Um, okay, with that, Valerie, thank you for doing this. This is like perfect timing because um, I have to admit, I've already seen a couple of Christmas holiday lights go up, and mm -hmm. I know after Thanksgiving <clears throat> they're going to be switches are going to be uh, flipped. So it's just perfect timing to do this. All right, with that, I'm going to close out this um, session. Thank you, Valerie, so much for doing well, this. Hang on, you forgot my commercial. Do I get a commercial? Oh, sure. Go ahead. Do it. I'll do it. Well, okay. If anybody's interested in um, and maybe follow me on Instagram and see that I've been posting that, but I do do a um, fine art calendar every single year, and it's just one way to kind of help. Uh, well, for me, the most important thing is I love to share my images and share it with scripture. And so that's what the images are all um, that way. But they're some of my favorite images. And so if anybody's interested in one of those, it's on like Facebook and on my website and yeah. on Facebook. Yeah. Everywhere. Oh, uh, just a reminder, her website is ValerieHoffmanPhotography.com. All right. Now I'm going to close out this session. Um next week we're off it's for the uh, thanksgiving holiday but please join us on november 29th for beth below's presentation the non-literal lens letting go of labels through abstract photography until next time go out and create something beautiful and hope that we see you again soon <laughs>